Hello and welcome back to CS 11747 Neural Networks for NLP. This time I'm going to be talking about learning from and for knowledge bases. And knowledge bases, uh, the first thing I think we should do is define what a knowledge base is. And basically it's a structured database of knowledge usually containing, for example, entities such as nodes in the graph and relations uh, which are edges between nodes. Of course, there are other varieties of knowledge bases that we could use as well, but um, this is kind of the most common format for them. Um, and this basically brings us to a couple questions. How can we uh, learn to create and expand knowledge bases with neural networks? And how can we learn from the information in knowledge bases to improve neural representations or models? And so I'm going to talk about uh, several topics related to this. And near the end, we're going to have a guest presentation by Zheng Baozheng on uh, probing the knowledge included in uh, neural language models, which is a very interesting recent topic. Another question uh, that we're not going to explicitly cover in this class as much um, is how can we use the structured knowledge to answer questions? And um, I talked a little bit about this in uh, the class on semantic parsing, um, and I'm happy to discuss further with the people in the class if you'd like to know more about this. So let's first go to types of knowledge bases. So a first uh, attempt at a knowledge base that I've already talked about in this class is WordNet, which is a large database of words, including parts of speech and semantic relations between the words. And for example, um, between nouns, you might have something like an is a relation. Uh, so a hatchback is a type of car, a part of relation, which is where a wheel is a part of a car um, and uh, things like this. There's also a type and instance distinction. So for example, uh, a hatchback could be a type of car, but the specific hatchback that I own or the specific hatchback that appeared in a movie would be a specific instance of the car. There are also uh, verb relations ordered by specificity. So we could have things like communicate and then talk and then whisper. And adjective relations like antonyms, uh, wet and dry. So this is rather, uh, it's a very expansive uh, lexical database of English, but it's also a little bit limited uh, in the types of uh, things that it handles. It's mainly focused on English words only. Um, psych is an example of a kind of classical uh, knowledge base that was built for um, kind of traditional AI applications corresponding to uh, reasoning, solving reasoning problems. And the attempt was to encode all common sense knowledge and it was created manually for 30 years. Um, and it includes things like thing at the very top, and then we have intangible things, individuals, sets, relations, collections, uh, math. Um, it also has spatial knowledge, uh, such as spatial parts, borders, geometry, things about physical objects, things about weather, living things, sentient beings. Um, and then below this, it has all types of domain-specific knowledge and domain-specific facts and data. So this was a, a really, really ambitious project, uh, perhaps overly ambitious, in that uh, there's so many different types of knowledge that it uh, is a little bit difficult to you know, specify all of them manually, of course. Um, so after, uh, you know, with the advent of kind of the larger internet and also uh, curated resources like Wikipedia, um, people started to realize that there's lots of uh, data sources online that we can use is uh, that kind of naturally occur and we can use as sources of structured knowledge. So to give an example, um, in Wikipedia, there is this Carnegie Mellon University page and the Carnegie Mellon uh, University page on the right has an info box that includes things like former names, motto, type, of the university, uh, when it was established, et cetera, et cetera. And these can be extracted into individual um, pieces of structured data about Carnegie Mellon University. 
And this was done in DBpedia in uh, 2007. And this has been further expanded into uh, Wikidata, which is a curated database of entities um, linked in extremely large scale, it's multilingual. So Wikidata is kind of now the de facto standard in um, what you would want to use for kind of knowledge-based applications. It still is mostly based around entities and relations. Um, so it definitely does have temporal information like date of birth, place of birth, and stuff like this. But it doesn't include some types of information that nonetheless would be useful, like spatial uh, knowledge and other things. So in terms of the scope and the number of entities it covers and uh, the breadth, it's definitely impressive, but it's also not quite, you know, the vision that Psych, for example, uh, attempted to uh, realize where you would encode all of common sense knowledge along with domain specific facts and things like this. So um, uh, while these uh, resources are impressive, they're also inherently incomplete. And another example of how Wikidata is incomplete is um, I don't remember the exact percentage, uh, but maybe I'll talk about it later. The, um, the total number of humans that have a date of birth included in Wikipedia is, uh, in Wikidata is relatively small, whereas, you know, every human has a date of birth. So we're sure, you know, that information should be included for each person. So, you know, the information is very expansive, but also incomplete at the same time. So uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is learning representations from knowledge bases. So uh, one very uh, useful and broadly uh, used kind of method is learning knowledge graph embeddings. And what knowledge graph embeddings are is they're basically embeddings of entities or relations that are learned directly from a knowledge graph. And um, the simplest way to do this is expressing triples as additive transformations. Um, and uh, the method is minimizing the distance of existing triples with a margin-based loss that um, attempts to make the existing triples closer than kind of distractor uh, false triples that are, not, uh, that are not actually in that relation. So um, we've talked about margin-based losses before. So we have our margin here. We have the... Um, the distance of a uh, true triple. So this is the distance of the head plus the relation embedding um, and then the tail of the, of the triple. And then we have the distance of a head plus uh, the relation embedding and the tail of a distractor uh, kind of triple that is not included, not actually included in the knowledge base. So just to give an example, because this is a little bit abstract, you know, this could be um, person, and this could be place of birth, um, and then this could be the actual person's place of birth. So, um, you know, if it was uh, Barack Obama, it could be uh, Barack Obama, place of birth, and then Hawaii, for example. Um, so... One thing to uh, note is that this has one uh, vector for each relation um, and is doing additive modification only. So it's a relatively simple uh, method for learning embeddings. And there's lots of improvements uh, on it. Um, and the, uh, including more complicated models, uh, the NTN that I listed here is something called a neural tensor network. Um, that uses tensors and things like this. But there's basically lots and lots of methods for learning knowledge graph embeddings. And um, there's uh, surveys and things like this that you can look into if there's more, uh, if you'd like to learn more. So um, I mentioned before that knowledge bases are incomplete. And so even with extremely large scale, um, as I said before, free base 71% of humans were missing the date of birth. And so one question is, how can we um, perform relation extraction to extract information for knowledge bases? And um, once we have our knowledge base embeddings, 
um, we can then remember that we have consistency in embeddings. So basically, uh, if we have king minus man plus woman equals queen, um, we can find that given king and given this relation embedding, so we can kind of think of this minus man plus woman is a relation embedding that shifts the gender of man to woman. And so if we take king and then we add this relation embedding, we get queen. And if queen is the nearest neighbor, we could say that queen is the kind of uh, female equivalent of king. So relation extraction, um, using these knowledge graph embeddings, basically the way it works is exactly this. We try to um, take the embeddings that we already have that were learned either from uh, textual data or, um, or knowledge graph based data and try to extract new relations that we did not know about before. So um, basically the way it works is um, we have two entity embeddings here um, and we maybe multiply them by, uh, by weights. Uh, and we take a uh, we take a um, nonlinear function of this, and then we multiply it by a scoring function to just predict whether a relation exists or not. So this is just a regular MLP, as you'll see. Um, this could also be formulated as concatenating E1 and E2 and multiplying it by a weight matrix. Um, it, it would be uh, functionally equivalent. Um, there's also um, uh, other methods. So one example of this method would be the neural tensor network, uh, which adds a bilinear uh, feature function here. So in addition to the um, uh, in addition to the MLP that we just talked about before, it also adds this um, bilinear function here, where we have entity one transpose entity two, and then we have a weight matrix in between. And uh, it basically tries to predict whether the uh, relation exists between the two. So um, basically, uh, this is not the only model that exists for this task of relation extraction uh, with neural networks. Um, there's lots of other follow-up work, including um, just the simple thing, additive model that I talked about before, and also other, um, other models that do things that are a little bit more sophisticated to take care of problems of like one-to-many relations or other things like this. Um, so if this uh, idea of extracting knowledge from word embedding sounds interested to you, you can certainly take a look at this uh, work as well. So another way we can learn relations is not from embeddings, but learning them from text directly. And uh, the way this works is you basically look up uh, text that explicitly says that two entities are in a relation. So one example of this would be something like uh, text that says Barack Obama was born in Hawaii. Um, and if this is you know, from an authoritative source or something like this, if you can identify um, this sentence is strong evidence that these two entities are in a relation. You can use that to extract information. So basically, um, one very popular way of doing this is uh, through a method called distance supervision. And the reason why we need to use distance supervision is it's very hard to get large annotated data sets um, that basically cover all of these uh, relations that we might want to handle. However, it's easy or we can look into Wikidata to get a whole bunch of entities that are in a particular relation. So what we do is given a whole bunch of entity relation entity triples, um, we extract all text that m matches the two entities and use it to train. So for example, uh, let's say we have an example of S Steven Spielberg and uh, Saving Private Ryan, where Steven Spielberg is the director of Saving Private Ryan, we would extract all text that um, uh, includes Steven Spielberg and Saving Private Ryan. And that would include both, uh, uh, that would include uh, text like Steven Spielberg's film, Saving Private Ryan, and Alison co-produced the Academy Award-winning uh, Saving Private Ryan, directed by Steven Spielberg. 
And these are obviously positive training examples. Um, however, it would also uh, create some negative training examples as well. So if you had um, uh, Steven Spielberg made uh, $10 million from Saving Private Ryan, nowhere in that example does it explicitly tell you or even indicate that Steven Spielberg is the actor uh, sorry, is the director of Saving Private Ryan as opposed to some other relation like after. So basically, this is a, a cheap and efficient way to create data, but also uh, can be noisy. So um, there's a bunch of different ways to extract information from this. And basically, um, all you would like to do is you would like to take a classifier uh, that takes in the two entities, the position of the two entities, and the sentence and um, tries to tell you uh, one, uh, like whether they are in the relation based on this sentence. And um, you can, uh, traditionally this was done using like syntactic models. So you'd have like syntactic paths between um, the sentences uh, and neural models uh, basically uh, make it possible to do this without using any syntax. So, this is one of the early examples from 2014. So it basically extracts features uh, using CNNs, uh, like lexical features of the word um, uh, and features of the whole span extracted using convolution. Um, so the exact details of this are not uh, very important. You know, now if I were to build a model like this, I would uh, just use BERT or, or some other kind of pre-trained language model to uh, extract the features. And that's indeed what people do nowadays. Um, another uh, thing that is interesting is um, the thing that I talked about before with respect to knowledge base, uh, learning from knowledge bases, is that you can learn embeddings directly from knowledge bases based on the existing relations that are in knowledge bases and then use them to induce new relations. So basically, um, there are two trade-offs in, uh, in trying to learn entity embeddings or relations from text and knowledge bases. Um, one thing is that in many cases, the knowledge bases can actually be relatively complete. So if it's somebody who, like, let's say we're talking about a person who's kind of only moderately, you know, famous or talked about on the internet. Um, if that's the case, it might be very possible that there's more information included on a knowledge base like DBpedia or the structured information that's included in a knowledge base like DBpedia is more complete than the text that could be found online. On the other hand, if we're talking about something that isn't extensively included in DBpedia, so like let's say um, uh, biomedical phenomena or something like this. There's a whole bunch of text online about biomedical phenomena, um, but this is not included in DBpedia. Um, so uh, both of these are complementary sources of information and it's possible to jointly um, model uh, KB relations in text to improve our accuracy. Um, and uh, so there's a bunch of different uh, ways to do this. This is just one example. Um, so basically it models uh, textual links between words uh, using a, a neural network. Uh, and it can also um, basically, uh, you can also model um, the knowledge base relations as well. And um, so what this, in particular does is it extracts like subject uh, founder of object, subject co-founded object, or other things like dependency relations, and uh, model them using CNNs. But you can similarly do this for uh, like knowledge base uh, relations in the knowledge base itself. So this could be, you know, subject, um, subject born in, um, and then, or subject parents born in. And if you know that somebody's parents were born in a particular place, it's also more likely that that person was born in the particular place. So that would be additional evidence 
uh, that a person was born somewhere. So another thing that I mentioned, which is important for relation extraction, is um, that distant supervision can introduce noise into your learning objectives. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, some examples are not actually good uh, instances to be used in training. Um, so this uh, paper is an interesting paper uh, that basically uh, the idea is that there's noise in distant supervision labels, so we would like to model it. And uh, the way this works is essentially we might have a small amount of actually cleanly labeled data. So a small amount of data where we have sentences and human annotations that say the, that these sentences are actually true examples, true training examples that indicate the relation. And then we have, might have a whole bunch of other uh, potentially noisy, distantly uh, supervised data. And um, the way this works, uh, this method works, is on the clean data, we just uh, train a predictor. On the noisy data, we have a noise uh, modeling uh, layer that basically learns a confusion matrix uh, between the two, uh, between the predictions. So we might have an example where, um, to take the example that I talked about before, we have Saving Private Ryan and then um, like making money or something like this. And so um, the predictor uh, might, um, the predictor might predict like uh, something like uh, purse director or something like this, but then we add this uh, transition matrix and then it spreads it out more widely across a whole bunch of different, um, you know, classes of people who might be involved with movies or something like this. And by controlling the transition matrix, you can kind of adjust to the amount of noise expected in the data. And they use a method um, uh, called trace normalization that tries to make the matrix close to the identity to say, we expect that there will be some noise, but not, you know, infinite amounts of noise in our predictions. So the details of this are, um, you know, like you can go and read the paper if this sounds interesting, but basically the idea is that if we know we have noise in our data specifically for relation extraction, then we can go in and model that noise and improve. So another important thing is now we've talked a lot about how we can use neural networks to extract knowledge bases. How can we use knowledge bases to inform the neural models? So a very popular way of doing this is um, essentially by taking embeddings such as word embeddings and uh, take, like modifying these embeddings to match existing lexicons or knowledge bases. So um, this is similar to uh, joint learning of embeddings and, um, and knowledge bases. And, uh, you know, for example, joint learning of text and, and knowledge base embeddings but it can be done through post hoc uh, transformation of embeddings. And the advantage of this is that it's usable with any pre-trained embedding. So like, let's say you have um, uh, fast text embeddings or BERT embeddings or something like this, and you would like to make them more appropriate for modeling your, uh, your knowledge base. So um, uh, you could do this kind of post hoc uh, transformation. And there's a double objective of making the transformed embeddings close to their neighbors um, and close to the original embedding. So basically, um, we have the, um, uh, the example here where we want to have the transformed embeddings be, uh, be close to the original embeddings. And then on the right side, we have um, a set of neighbors. So E is a set of neighbors where we have embedding I and embedding J, which are neighbors in a graph or something like this. And um, then we would like to make them close uh, to their neighbors. So you can improve the embeddings based on whatever lexical or knowledge base information you have. You can also use this to force antonyms away from each other. So for example, if you have a lexical database that also includes antonyms, uh, you could make sure that it moves uh, the antonyms away. So basically then you would want to subtract uh, any uh, objective with respect to antonyms. 
So another uh, way you can use uh, knowledge bases is by injecting knowledge into uh, language models or other models that um, uh, that make it possible to uh, to make predictions or generate text or whatever else. And um, the uh, way this can be done is by pro providing LMs with uh, knowledge in the form of copyable graphs, where um, each text is uh, given relevant uh, knowledge base entries taken from Wikidata. And um, we examine all possible um, so in basically what this does is we have each, um, uh, so to give an example of this, like let's say we're talking about um, uh, Barack, uh, Barack Obama, like let's say we know that we have a text about Barack Obama um, and we wanted to generate a text uh, regarding Barack Obama and so Normally, we could uh, we could just you know prefix with like Barack Obama or something like that and continue generating, but if we're talking about um, somebody who is not quite so famous or widely mentioned on the web, then it's quite possible that a language model would not be able to generate coherent text about them. And because of this, um, what this model does is it essentially allows you to either generate. Um, you know, word by word, like a traditional language model would do, or generate kind of a template birth name. And this birth name would then be filled in with the birth name according to Wikidata. Um, or birth, you could generate birth date, and it would generate the birth date. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to, number one, prime the model to be generating information about particular entities. And number two, uh, gen you know, be more factual essentially because you're encouraging it to generate things directly from the knowledge you have as opposed to um, other knowledge. Uh, so, or as opposed to just generating from the language model, which might kind of hallucinate facts essentially. So, um, another uh, thing that uh, is uh, an interesting work that we have done recently is um, answering questions uh, using text corpora is a traceable um, knowledge base. And so basically the way it works is um, if we have a question, uh, when was the Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan album released? Uh, what this method does is it essentially indexes an entire text corpus. And after you index the entire text corpus, um, it searches into this text corpus for uh, particular entities and makes steps through the text corpus to look up new uh, entities. So um, the basic idea is that we treat a text corpus essentially as a knowledge base. And um, the method, is, as you can see from the, uh, like, diagram here is, is somewhat complicated, uh, but basically um, the, the basic idea is this, you know, you index mentions of entities into a text corpus and then you make multiple steps through this text corpus um, to uh, like you would make multiple steps through a knowledge base to answer questions or something like this. So um, one other important thing to talk about is uh, schema-free extraction. So up until this point, I've talked about um, essentially knowledge bases where we have a schema of the knowledge base, and we have a bunch of relations that are explicitly mentioned in the knowledge base, like place of birth, place of education, uh, birth name, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, however, this limit, th you know, having all of our relations defined beforehand for us uh, can be an issue uh, in that, you know, maybe it's not uh, correct um, or, or it's not comprehensive enough to cover all of the relations we would like to cover. So uh, one method that attempts to tackle this is open information extraction where the text itself is the relation. Um, so to give an example, um, United States has a hub in Chicago, which is the headquarters of uh, United Continental Holdings. 
um, we would basically extract United State. United has a hub in and Chicago, where has a hub in is the relation. And Chicago is the headquarters of United Continental Holdings. Um, so this is great in that it can extract of any variety of relations. Um, but the issue with this is that it does not uh, abstract well uh, to, like, for example, finding similar relations, uh, it, like immediately anyway, because, uh, for example, if we had United Continental Holdings is headquartered in Chicago, um, that would be treated as an entirely different relation than is the headquarters of. So most methods for uh, this open information extraction are rule-based, which basically use a parser to extract according to rules, such as a relation uh, having to contain a predicate subject object and must be a noun phrase, etc. cetera. Um, then they train a tr fast model to extract over large amounts of data and um, aggregate multiple pieces of evidence to find uh, common and therefore potentially reliable extraction. So basically, um, you know, very little to uh, very little machine learning going on here, mostly based on rules. There are also neural models for open IE and unfortunately heuristics are still not per uh, perfect. Um, so uh, one way to do this is to rather um, train a model uh, where you ask crowdsource workers to um, essentially uh, answer questions about text and, um, and use these questions to, uh, to kind of extract uh, training data for open uh, information extraction systems. And this can be converted into open IE extractions for use in a supervised uh, neural tagger, for example, which can uh, significantly improve accuracy. Okay, now finally, I'd like to talk a little bit more about learning relations from relations. So as I mentioned before, um, word embeddings give information or entity embeddings give information of the word in context, uh, which can be indicative of KB traits and other relations are also indicative. And importantly, also open IE extractions can, um, uh, can be informative as well. So basically we can think of kind of three different uh, sources of knowledge. Knowledge graph embeddings uh, or entity embeddings, uh, relations uh, that we know of already and have been annotated and automatically extracted relations through OpenIE. And so now we have a graph and we'd like to add more links to the graph um, uh, using these various sorts of information. So one way we can do this is uh, matrix factorization um, where we basically take a knowledge base and we take all of the um, uh, relations that we already know of, um, like uh, this uh, free base or Wikidata relation attack relation over here. And we also have um, some open IE uh, relations over here. And then we essentially uh, factorize our matrix um, to try to predict new uh, links that we might not have known about before in uh, our new, like, the four new entity pairs, for example. So this allows us to pull in all different kinds of information and, uh, like, further improve the, the accuracy of uh, filling out our knowledge base. Okay, so that's all I have for my part. And finally, I'd like to finish up uh, with a part on uh, probing language models for, um, for the information that they have with respect to relations. And then this is yet another uh, source of data that we now have at our exposal, uh, at our disposal for uh, you know, learning knowledge about uh, entities and the relations between them. So I'll turn it over to Zheng Bao for the last part. Hi, in this part, I'm going to talk about probing factual knowledge contained in pre-trained language models. For knowledge-intensive tasks like question answering, traditional models usually refer to external knowledge, such as articles in Wikipedia and knowledge bases like Freebase to answer questions. However, given the fact that language models are pre-trained on a large text corpus, 
Our hypothesis is that by modeling the distribution of our text, launch models might already capture significant amount of factor knowledge. So in the following slides, I'll be talking about several papers on this topic. The first paper is called Launch Models as Knowledge Basis. In this paper, they first propose to probe factor knowledge contained in launch models. Comparing to querying knowledge bases, where we use structured query languages like Sparkle or Circle, to query language models, we use natural language prompts. In the figure down below, I showed you one example where we used the natural language prompt Dante was burning mask to query the language model. To be more specific, in this paper, they propose a benchmark called LAMA. In this benchmark, they manually design prompts for 45 relations. For example, for the place of birth relation, the prompt is X was born in Y. Then they sample subject-object pairs from a knowledge graph with data, and then they fill in the subjects and let the language model to predict the objects. For example, uh, one particular example to prop the knowledge graph, uh, to prop the language model could be Barack Obama was born in Musk. In the figure down below, I showed you the prediction generated by the bird based model, where the top one prediction, Chicago, is actually incorrect. The correct answer should be Hawaii, by the way. In this paper, they examined several launch models, including ELMO, uh, Transformer XL, and bird based And uh, the accuracy of the bird based model is over 30%, which is uh, quite impressive. And this basically means that for 30% of subject-object pairs, the bird based model can correctly predict the object, given the prompt. In the previous paper, they only use manually designed prompts to query the large model, which might be suboptimal. So given an inappropriate prompt, we might fail to retrieve facts that the large model does know. So in this paper, how can we know what language models know? We try to use more diverse prompts to query language models. In this figure, the manual prompt for the developer relation is X is developed by Y. And this is created by the previous paper. And in this paper, we try two approaches to generate more diverse prompts. Either mining the Wikipedia articles or paraphrasing initial prompts with a back translation, back translation model. So as you can see in the figure, the mind prompt is Y released the X, and the paraphrase prompt is X is created by Y. And uh, from the prediction generated by the bird based model, we can see that using the mind prompts and the paraphrase prompts, we can uh, correctly generate the, the correct prediction Microsoft at the top one position. Finally, we assemble the predictions from multiple prompts through a weighted sum, and this leads to further uh, accuracy improvements. So next paper proposed a method called AutoPrompt. In this paper, they try to automatically generate prompts to uh, prop knowledge from language models. So the basic idea is that instead of using prompts that exist in the corpus, they directly search tokens in the prompt guided by gradients. To be more specific, first, they will specify the max number of trigger tokens denoted in, denoted in the purple color. So in the example in the figure, they use four tokens as trigger tokens. They initialize those trigger tokens to, to the mask token, fill in the subject, and then iteratively update those trigger tokens to maximize the probability of the correct answer. In each update, they compute the gradients of the loss function with respect to the trigger token embedding and replace the trigger token with other tokens whose embeddings aligns with the direction of the gradient. In the examples from the table, 
you can see that uh, most of the prompts generated by the auto prompt methods are actually not proper English sentences, but they are better at eliciting knowledge from language models, which is uh, which is an interesting observation. And this paper further increased the accuracy from 30% to 33% using those automatically generated prompts. The next paper is called P-Tuning. Uh, the previous paper auto-prompt the search tokens, which is discrete. While in this paper P-Tuning, they directly optimize the embedding of the tokens in the prompts, which is continuous and hopefully easier to optimize. So as you can see in the figure, previous methods, they generate prompts using by searching a discrete tokens, while in the p-tuning methods, they directly optimize the input embedding, which is denoted by h0 to hm, if there are m tokens in the prompts. And this further increased the performance from 43% to 48%. All of the previous methods mentioned in previous slides they use prompts to prop language models. In this, in this paper, close boot T5, they directly fine tune the T5 model, which is a sequence to sequence model, to generate the answer given the question. So, as you can see in the figure, the, they directly fine tune the T5 model to generate the answer uh, 1882, given the question when was Franklin born? Because no additional context is given to the language model, the parameters of the language model have to contain relevant knowledge in order to answer those questions. And in this paper, they demonstrated that using the closed book T5 model, they can even outperform uh, QA models with retrieved context, such as the DRQA model. However, uh, the previous results on propping factor knowledge from language models might be over-optimistic. And part of the reason is because they only focus on English, which has a huge amount of resources. In this paper, x Factual, we prop knowledge in other languages, such as uh, French, uh, Dutch, and uh, lots of lower source languages. We cover 24 languages and use manual prompts created by native speakers to prop multilingual language models. As you can see from the, from the chart, overall the factual knowledge in language models is still limited. For most of the languages, the performance is lower than 10%, and the accuracy is even lower for lower source languages. All of the previous methods, they only rely on the parameters of the language models to answer questions. However, almost unsurprisingly, non-parametric methods that use retrieval results from external resources, uh, like Wikipedia articles, usually outperform parametric methods that only rely on language model parameters. For example, the RAM and REC model, they will first retrieve passages from Wikipedia Use, uh, that are relevant to the questions, and then generate, uh, generate the final answer given both the question and the retrieved context. On the natural question data sets, the non-parametric methods performs better than the closed book T5 model. So this is all I have for this part, and I'm happy to answer any questions regarding details of the papers I discussed in the slides, either in class or offline.